Welcome to the Gilded Age and Progressive Era, a podcast about the United States and the world in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. I'm your host, Michael Patrick Cullinane. Welcome back. We have another treat today with a look at the employer side of labor relations, and it's not flattering. I'm guessing that most people know about the heavy-handed tactics of employers, and that's probably an understatement. Heavy-handed is probably an understatement. The Pinkertons are often the group that come to mind. They're that detective agency that saved the life of President Lincoln and then transformed into a union-busting gang that collected intelligence and murdered workers seeking to organize. The Pinkertons had remarkable success in suppressing industrial action, whether it was in collapsing the Irish-American Molly Maguires or prompting the state to intervene because of the assassination of homestead strikers. We know the Pinkertons because we know their tactics, and we recognize how draconian and inhuman they are. Now, what if I told you that the Pinkertons were only the tip of the iceberg and that there were many other such groups, most of them volunteer organizations, that had similar and worse tactics? And what if I told you that they were dressed up as good citizenship groups? Now, fair warning today, some of the stories you'll hear in the podcast tell of employees being deported, killed, harassed, and intimidating in the most horrible fashion. And we need to hear about these stories because if we don't recognize the heinous acts and the normalization of them at the time, will miss the normalization of similar activities today. And let me tell you, there are some real parallels between employer organizations and radical domestic terrorism in our own day and age. Today, I'm speaking with Professor Chad Pearson, who's done extensive research on the topic. Chad is Professor of History at the University of North Texas. And for listeners who are following the shows in chronological order, this is the third historian from Texas in a row. So no one can say I haven't given the state a fair share of attention recently. Chad is a labor historian and the author of two books. His first came out in 2016 and is called Reform and Repression, Organizing America's Anti-Union Movement. It's a staple on the Gilded Age and Progressive Era reading lists, and uh, so should his latest, Capitals Terrorists, Klansmen, Lawmen, and Employers in the Long 19th Century. And that's the one we're going to be discussing today. I'm delighted to welcome Chad to the show. Thank you so much. This is, I'm delighted to be here. Yeah, well, I'm delighted to have you because I think most of the time when we think about uh, sort of lawmen or paramilitaries of the Gilded Age, we think of the Pinkertons a lot. And I'm sure listeners will know about the Pinkertons, but uh, they probably haven't heard an awful lot about employer organizations like the Citizens Alliance or your book talks about the Citizens International or sorry, the Citizens Industrial Association. So while the Pinkertons sound like the name sounds kind of ominous. Citizens Alliance sounds kind of pleasant. Um, you know, what what are these employer organizations all about? Certainly. So basically, in the late 19th and early 20th century, one of the defining issues, of course, is the so-called labor problem. And so unlike other historians who study this, um, I begin with the Ku Klux Klan. And I argue that the Klan was an employer's association. Obviously, it functioned differently uh, than than other employers associations in particularly in, in urban centers. Um, but I look at a number of strikes, including the Civil War, which I argue was I followed W.B. Du Bois in arguing that this was a a general strike. And uh, and then I also look at a number of other uh, labor, more traditional labor uprisings in uh, in railroad and coal, uh, coal mining, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, factory work, all, all these sorts of things. And so in the face of all of these uh, uprisings, labor uprisings, employers got together. They formed organizations. So in the Reconstruction period, it was the Ku Klux Klan. In the Gilded Age, it was often these uh, law and order leagues. And in the Progressive Era, we have these citizens' alliances. And as you point out, this sounds very pleasant, right? Citizens' alliance. And so why? Why did these folks name themselves that? And I uh, maintain uh, that they were very savvy, when it came to public relations, this is the progressive era. Uh, there are many middle class people who are concerned about the so-called labor problem, want to help uh, workers. And what the uh, spokespersons for the Citizens Alliance did was they, rather than talk about fighting the dangerous classes, they, they talked about protecting the common people. And who did they mean by the common people? They meant non-union workers. And so language is particularly important in the progressive era. Uh, it's also important in earlier periods, but I think the uh, 
by, by the early 20th century, we really see um, a strong effort on the part of, of union busters to frame labor management conflicts in ways that serve their interest and that gained legitimacy in the broader public sphere. So we'll come back to the KKK, but since you brought up language, I think we need to we need to talk about the elephant in the room. So the book is called Capitals Terrorists, right? And you you call them terrorists. So why do you think that word is a better fit? I think the word works because when we look at what the victims of their violence um, said, the, the, these were you know strike breaking, union busting blacklisting. These were traumatic events. And so what I show is that a number of these employers got their own hands dirty and fought workers directly. They kidnapped workers. They whipped workers. They um, engaged in these drive out campaigns, forcing people to leave their communities. They shot at workers. Um, and so I think these are pretty good definitions of terrorism. That is to to you know to use extra legal means to solve a problem, to solve your uh, because you have some sort of political uh, agenda, right? And so, I don't think folks will think that it was it's particularly controversial to refer to the Klan as a terrorist organization, right? That's sort of uh, that's accepted wisdom. Um, most people believe that. But to to call the Citizens Alliances in the Law and Order League might strike some as, as going a little too far. But if you look at some of the activities that these folks engaged in, again, kidnappings, um, driving people out, I think that that the terrorism label is warranted. And uh, it's it's provocative. Yes, I get it. But uh, let's I want to save I want to rescue this word from the anti-labor spokespersons of this time, right? Beverly Gage wrote a book called America's First Age in Terror of Terrorism. I think you uh, know about that book. And, and she uh, basically looked at events like Haymarket. She looked at Leon Cholkish, the individual who shot and killed uh, William McKinley. And um, she, in, a, in another article, talked about how, it, you know, we usually don't consider employer violence terrorists, right? Or, or it hasn't been considered something like that. And so I say, you know, I, I think that this some of their violent activities or, or their violent activities were, in fact, um, uh, examples of, of terrorism. And so I want to rescue the word terrorism from the anti-labor spokespersons of the late 19th and early 20th century. And I want to rescue it from today's Islamophobes who equate terrorism with Muslims, you know, bearded Muslim men from the Middle East. I think it's it, it, you make a very strong case for the word. You you sort of um, you break us in. You, your first chapter is about the KKK, and there's two things that I want to talk about with that chapter. One is the fact that it it makes a strong case for why the Gilded Age and Progressive Era starts after the Civil War. That the Reconstruction period is as much part of this Gilded Age and Progressive Era as any other, uh, because citizenship is is int intimately connected to employment in your book, and I think that's where that Citizens Alliance uh, bit comes in. But the other thing is, is your chapter on the KKK is an intersectional approach. And you, your whole book really is in a way. It's it's not letting race and class get separated. It's bringing it all together. And I was wondering if you thought that all of this gets us a little bit closer to the past as it was actually lived. I, I think so. I think, you know, I mean, I hope so. And I, I really appreciate that question. Um, I, I wanted to really understand the forces that undermined the interest of ordinary people, right, um, on a day-to-day -day level, as well as when they they resisted. And so, uh, yes, it's intersectional, certainly uh, in that first chapter about the Klan. But I I take on some of these folks who who have in the past invoked intersectionality to kind of downplay class as a um, unit of analysis, and I try to reintroduce classes, sort of the, the major division, not to dismiss or to overlook uh, gender and race, but fundamentally, if we look at the Klan, right, the leadership, for the most part, consisted of more the downwardly mobile privileged people, right, folks who had lost in the, in the wake of the, the Civil War. And what did they want? They wanted control over their communities. They wanted control over the workforce. And how did they accomplish that? Right. They accomplished that by engaging in kidnapping, by driving out northern teachers uh, and by, you know, uh, whipping disobedient um, uh, former slaves. And yeah. And you also talk about soft repression as well or repression that doesn't require physical violence. Uh, 
how does that work? I mean, because the Klan one sets us up for this really, you know, clear and uh, direct uh, terrorist sort of uh, uh, sobriquet. But but actually, there's this soft repression as well, which is a big part of the book. Right. Exactly. And so um, I, I talk about uh, blacklisting and book burning. Uh, and in the case of the Klan, you have folks who uh, would burn down schoolhouses, they would drive out teachers, and they would burn books. Because fundamentally what the Klan wanted was a black laboring class that did nothing during the day but work, in essence, right? They didn't want them to be educated. They didn't want them to go to schools. They didn't want them to vote, right? Shut up and work. And, and so the books, right? I mean, they talk explicitly about this. They talk, they said, you know, education will hurt the value of black labor, right? They're explicit about this. And so I want to connect in this book, you know, um, labor control with um, a desire to kind of push out any of these, uh, you know, any any educational forces that might, um, you know, uh, that would uh, uh, take the black laboring class off the pl plantations, off out of the kitchens, off the farms, etc. And um, I, so the, the the idea of fear is pervasive in the book too. I mean, as I was reading this, I mean, there's a lot of things that really disturbed me about reading this. I mean, <laughs> I've, sure. I've got some questions about some of those disturbing things, but you know, what you're getting to here is really the the idea of fear and inculcating fear in uh, communities. Um, sure. And your and your book your book looks at more than just the employer organizations as the agents of that fear, and that's the thing that I think I'd really like you to spend some time talking about. You talk about enablers and narrative creators as part of the sort of the the entire uh the other parts of the the other agents of of fear and so who are these actors certainly so um i'm primarily interested in employers and those people who uh sought to exploit and control labor uh, and in looking at their various clampdowns against uh, working class people for various reasons, uh, we got asked the question, well, well, how was it that they were able to get away with this, right? And the reason is because the state, state forces from judges to politicians to police officers to National Guardsmen, sometimes federal troops, right, basically sided with employers in the context of labor management conflicts. Sure, there are exceptions here or there, right? But for the most part, when workers demonstrated militancy, solidarity, when they shut down factories, when they prevented scabs from entering work sites, right? Did, you know, we certainly didn't see um, uh, police officers, say, arresting bosses for cutting wages, right? Uh, we, we did, you know, they, they, instead they would come and they would help protect um, uh, the, the strike breakers, uh, judges would issue injunctions, uh, politicians sometimes would call in uh, state forces. And so, you know, I I kind of take on this idea of, a, of you know, the, that the state is sort of neutral, right? I see the state really, you know, when push came to shove, the state was really there to back the business interests. And uh, that might sound crass, um, but I think the, the evidence backs me up. And, and what about the narrative creators? Because that, that's another group sure. as well. Absolutely. So, um the, the other issue that employers in the context of these conflicts had to, to deal with was how do they present their side of the story? And so uh, we have newspapers, we have clergymen, uh, even novelists who sought to legitimize, right? Sought to legitimize the uh, activities of, um, of violent employers. And so uh, I, I look in particular at uh, a novelist named Owen Wooster, who's very prominent in, uh, in, in American uh, literary history. Uh, and he worked for the Citizens Industrial Association of America. He was the author of The Virginian, which defined the Western you know, uh, a novel in many ways, this 1902 book. And so um, I look at, uh, I also look at, at newspaper accounts. A couple of the folks I write about were newspaper owners themselves. So of course, the information that they put out was, of course, very pro-business and anti-labor. Anti um, and so in saying that, you know, the uh, ruling class ideas were dominant is, is hardly an original observation, but I wanted to really dig down deep and look at some of the folks responsible for both for framing this issue and disseminating these ideas to, um, to the larger public. 
So I, I think listeners will get from the, the word terrorist that, the, you know, there is some politics in this, right? And the language has power and meaning. And so, do, and so does this idea about the other agents that are involved. And I think one of the questions that some readers might have is how much blame do we assign to those people that didn't shoot at uh, laborers or didn't kidnap laborers? I mean, if you're writing about it or you're preaching about it or you're Owen Wister, how much blame do we assign to those collaborators, I guess. Yeah, you know, it's 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 hard to say. It, these folks were were very very secretive, of course, right? They didn't want to reveal uh, their their um, their events. Although in some cases they did. And so I look at um, newspaper accounts and speeches. And so uh, I talk a little bit about the um, or a fair amount about this kidnapping in Tampa. And uh, where uh, citizens committee members kidnap uh, 13 leaders of this cigar worker strike, uh, members of La Resistencia, they put them on the boat and they bring them to Honduras, they leave them there. And uh, the press finds out about this, and this is all over the place, this is like, this is how you solve the labor problem. They were loud and proud about it. They didn't identify themselves at the time, but they were very pleased with themselves, okay? Another example, um, in uh, Cheyenne in 1903, or, uh, there's a strike of um, railroad workers and um, members of the citizens committee there go down, over 400 of them, they got guns, and they tell the strikers, you better get out of the way and let um, uh, let uh, let the strike breakers uh, uh, work. And one of the organizers of this talks, gives uh, gives a presentation about what they did at a Citizens Alliance meeting. And this is like, whoa, I mean, the crowd was really impressed, right? So what excited these people were these stories of, of um, you know, thuggish businessmen jumping into action, right? Maybe more so than the latest trends in, say, you know, scientific management or you know, uh, different uh, you know, uh, efficient efficiency methods used in in factories. So what I want to do in, in in pointing this out is to show, you know, what this is the modern period. This is you know the progressive era, but we need to understand the continuity of thuggery, right? We need to understand the continuity of thuggery. thuggery Vigilantism, it excited these people, right? And this is the progressive era. So let's let's talk maybe less about Frederick Taylor and more about, you know, businessmen getting together with their guns and, you know, uh confronting uh disobedient workers. I, I hope everyone heard clearly, but I'm gonna repeat again because this was the part of the book that I actually read over and over and over again that employers' organizations kidnapped workers, dropped them off in Honduras, and left them there, right? I mean, that's outrageous. Right. I mean, <laughs> so I, I think this is the, getting back to my question about the agency and about the blame, these are things that, I mean, we're, we're currently talking about people being deported in America from state to state. I mean, this is this is a really outlandish story of, of kidnapping. I'm glad you shared that with the audience. Um, I suppose the broader question I have about it is really about capitalism and violence, which seem in this period to go hand in hand. And I don't know, you're talking about continuity. Has it always been the case or is the Gilded Age and Progressive Era a different period where violence reflects the industrialization of America? Or do we see this throughout our history? Yeah, it's a good question. So certainly um, we don't see cases today of, say, Jeff Bezos taking a baseball bat and, you know, fighting, uh, you know, um, our workers at, uh, at, at at Amazon. Right. But, um, I, you know, I think when when things get really tense, right, there's, you know, when, when it, it, you know, when, when strikers become, you know, very militant and whatnot, you will see violence. Maybe it won't be, you know, um, uh, particularly employers today, but, um, you know, but, but, but police will certainly uh, mobilize. Uh, with respect to the Gilded Age and Progressive Era, you have so many different options, right? You have the uh, police, maybe National Guard, uh, maybe federal troops, uh, Pinkertons, others, and um, and they, they mobilize um, that, you know, and that the employer mobilize themselves, right? We see this in, in the Gilded Age, we see it in the Progressive Era, we see it into the 1930s. Um, and not as much after the 1930s, but you know, I think if if push came, you know, when push came to shove, uh, there were still some cases. Yeah, I think the maybe even talking about the current industrialization of America, the fourth industrial revolution, as they sometimes talk about it, it does seem to bring out uh, major questions of labor when you have these shifts in uh, in industrialization and the, and what that does to society. But maybe the best way of describing uh, just how brutal and oppressive. 
these employer organizations uh, were is to look at one of the people that you spend a lot of time exploring in the book, and that's Jay Wes Goodwin. I mean, he really yes. looms large here. So he's a newspaper man and, and a journalist. He's a vigilante. Tell us about him and, and tell us about uh, his impact on the, the movement. Right. So Jay West Goodwin uh, was uh, from Sedalia, Missouri. A lot of people don't know where Sedalia is. It's about an hour east of Kansas City uh, by car today. Uh, at the time um, when he lived there from the late 1860s to I think till his death in uh, uh, 1927, it was a, a growing city. It was a center of um, uh, Missouri Railroad, Jay Gould's interest there and um, Lots of railroad workers, Knights of Labor members. Uh, J. West Goodwin, you know, he ran this newspaper. He had a printing shop. Uh, his newspaper was called the Sedilia Bazoo. Uh, he had uh, you know, a handful of workers there. Uh, and he was very much active in uh, uh, the business community in Sedilia, wanted it to grow. And uh, had uh, had some problems with his own workers. Um, uh, they sought recognition. He fought them. He fired some. Uh, but he really comes to prominence in the context of the Great Southwest Railroad Strike of 1886. That was when workers, uh, Knights of Labor members, staged this massive multi-state, multi-line strike against Jay Gould. This was violent. This was a sort of... Um, you know, they sought to protect their interest after they won a previous strike in 1885. And, um, and J. J. West Goodwin used his paper to, um, uh, to, to denounce the, the strikers, to uh, stigmatize the leadership, including a guy named Martin Irons, who led this, this strike. And in the context of strike, he, along, along with many others, formed a Law and Order League. And the Law and Order League basically um, helped to escort strike breakers and to intimidate strikers. And at the end of the strike, uh, the Knights of Labor lost. Uh, uh, J. West, a lot of Gould and Hoaxie, the uh, regional manager uh, blacklisted a bunch of strikers, including uh, Martin Irons, most notably. And um, and so what happened in Sedalia is that um, this uh, this Law and Order League that J. West Goodwin was so involved in was, was so effective. And he and his colleagues built other Law and Order Leagues in other communities. Um, and we see Law and Order Leagues uh, popping up in places like Parsons, Kansas, Kansas City, St. Louis. And, um, and, and not only did they fight strikers, they also fought anarchists and socialists, and they sought to expel these people in the same way that the Klan expelled northern educators from their communities in the 18, late 1860s. And so um, J. West Goodwin earned this reputation nationally in the wake of the 1886 uh, railroad strike as this, this incredibly important union-busting figure. Um, and so fast forward to the turn of the century, and J. West Goodwin is active in forming citizens' alliances. Uh, all over, I know all over, but in many parts of the nation. Um, he brags about organizing about 30, and he referred to himself as the Christopher Columbus of the Citizens Alliance movement. And so he was, uh, uh, and, and you know, he, uh, he was not always successful, right? The Citizens Alliance that he formed in Sedalia, the first, uh, their first action was to prevent Missouri socialists from meeting. They got all these employers to agree not to allow any socialists to rent a room. And uh, one employer broke with them and the socialists met. Uh, and so they failed to stop that. And uh, his own workers, he recognized his own workers union in 1907, um, uh, topographical uh, union workers, uh, the International Topographical Union. So um, his, his bark was was uh, scarier than his bite at times, but he was a pretty ruthless guy. Why do you think he was able to command the attention of uh, these these groups of people? I mean, what made him so popular? I mean, I know he does a lot of talks. Is it is he a charismatic speaker? Is that what really draws people in? I, I think so. I mean, the evidence shows that, you know, when he spoke, people listened. He was able to really um, uh you know, get the the attention of of listeners. He he's very he's a very good he was a very good networker. He's active in the, these press associations. He's active in more general business associations. Uh, he um, and and apparently uh, Jay Gould paid him to uh, write negative portrayals of Martin Irons in his newspaper, right? And so 
people in the the ruling class that is the you know people like uh, Jay Gould apparently saw um, Jay West Goodwin as this you know reliable reliable figure right the 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 Bazoo his newspaper was a prominent paper that was a well known paper in Missouri right uh, none of us have heard of it today but it was uh, very prominent at it during its time and so uh, he gained a reputation and there are employers uh, from Scranton down to Pensacola Florida uh, who asked for him to come and help and organize these things and so. Um, and uh, he also got his butt kicked. Um, I forgot to mention that uh, uh, he wrote a um, very uh, he 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 denounced the this uh, burlesque performance in 1894, and the women in this play ended up breaking into his uh, office and uh, horsewhipped him. And then shortly thereafter, the owner of the opera house beat him up pretty bad, and he was forced to um, spend the rest of his life uh, walking with a cane or crutches. So um, just kind of an interesting, very colorful figure who plays a prominent role in, in building these, this, this movement, both in the 1880s and again at the turn of the century. So Goodwin also made me think a lot about the way we, we might think about this today. And that's kind of one of the goals of the podcast as well is to think about how the past connects with the future or the, sorry, the present, and then maybe perhaps the future. But uh, Goodwin says that cities in the Northeast, I mean, he's looking from his Midwest perspective to the Northeast, that they're crowded and filled with frantic and desperate men. And that tone and those comments uh, kind of, they they sound a little bit like what we might, might call sanctuary cities today or Donald Trump called shithole countries. Sure. You know, can we connect the past and the present through that rhetoric or is it is it are there other more obvious connections like Oath Keepers intimidating voters? Right, right. No, absolutely. Um, you know, Goodwin made that comment in the context of the 1877 rail, railroad strike. And uh, he he wasn't um, necessarily an anti-union ideologue at that point. I think he became one a little bit later. Uh I think he probably would have used the same language to describe uh, the drifters who came to Sedalia after uh, the collapse of Reconstruction. In, in particular, the African Americans who, you know, fled um, uh, fled uh, fled the South. Um, but the the comparisons that I think uh, I want to make uh, involve um, some of the 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 wealthier, you know, these people. You know, I, I want to look at I look at the late nineteenth, early twentieth century vigilantes. You know, they tended to be, you know, fairly wealthy, upper middle class um, to uh, to some of the uh, back the blue vigilantes today, you know, drive expensive pickup trucks. The folks who participate in the January 6th uh, insurrection. Right. Um, similar. Uh, we can identify similar cl uh, class based characteristics, similar worldviews. Uh, the January 6th event was certainly not an anti labor effort, but. These folks, like the Klansmen, uh, like Law and Order Leagues, you know, hated, uh, you know, uh, anti-racist activists. They 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 disliked anarchists, uh, just like the Law and Order League. And so there are some there are some parallels. And then, of course, there's this question of you know, getting your own hands dirty to get to make change, right? To engage in direct conflict, right? And so we tend to, uh, you know, many folks tend to. Uh, depict, uh, you know, the more privileged folks in our society as, you know, being above that, not engaging in that kind of direct conflict. And so uh, I, I sought to sh show that that was certainly not the case. Well, in some ways, that term terrorist then isn't that much of a far cry from how the FBI would class the uh, January 6th insurrection as domestic terrorists. So that that seems like a good fit. Um, you, you bring up the anti-union element of this, the anti-union, and, and there's a historiographical debate that you do raise in the book. Richard White, who was recently a guest on the show talking about his latest book, Who Killed Jane S uh, Stanford, uh, in his book Railroaded, he sees the law enforcement leagues as opposed to both the labor organizations and big corporate businesses. But you read the evidence slightly differently, and I want you to tell us how you see the law enforcement leagues uh, as, as, as not playing off both sides, but really taking one side. Sure. So there's a tendency historiographically. We see it with all the scholarship about populism. We see it uh, in, in the context of Richard White's work and uh, maybe Michael Kazin and others. And that is that 
uh, labor and farmer protesters were not necessarily anti-capitalist, but they were anti-big capitalists. They were against bigness. Uh, and that um, I think a lot of this scholarship kind of romanticizes to a certain extent the uh, small, small businesses. And so um, what I show is that no, the uh, support for anti-union causes uh, was pretty widespread and it involved everybody from Jay Gold all the way down to somebody like Jay West Goodwin, you know, who, who ran a, a relatively modest, um, though I think fairly profitable uh, um, uh, print, print house. And so, um, so the question becomes, okay, well, how do we, how do we understand um, the, uh, the, the role of groups like the Law and Order League in Sedalia? And the uh, Richard White, um, following other historians, I don't think he's original here, but he, he did make this point. Uh, they say that the Law and Order League were uh, consisted of people who want who, who were against uh, both big labor and big capital. And that these businessmen in Sedalia, you know, modest who, who ran modest sized businesses, uh, wanted to diversify, didn't want as much focus on uh, or didn't want Jay Gould to have as much power. OK, well, then how do we explain why these folks got their hands dirty, put their lives on the line uh, fighting these protesters who struck against Jay Gould's interest? Number one. Number two, after this strike, all of these many of these members, not all of these members of the Law and Order League went to meet with Hoaxie in St. Louis. Hoaxie worked under Jay Gould and say, hey, hey, we, we want you to continue to invest in Sedalia. Right. We want you to continue to invest in Sedalia. And uh, uh, Hoaxie said, OK, you know, I, I, I in the past, I haven't thought very highly of you folks, but I'm really impressed with what you did as members of this Law and Order League. So I am going to prioritize. I'm just going to make sure that those who apply do so as individuals, not as members of unions. Okay. The evidence is completely incompatible with what Richard White said. Right. You know, and, and others. So. You know, I, I, I think it's important, you know, I want to I want to push back against the tendency of all these historians to kind of uh, to, to, to see to, to portray small business or modest sized business as, you know, the, the, these these virtuous, uh, uh, you know, that, that business, small business owners are virtuous uh, figures all the time. And, and, you know, many of them were I don't, I don't want to generalize too much. But how do we make sense? What was the makeup of these? Uh, law and order leagues. What was the makeup of these open shop associations? They weren't all. Most people were certainly not like Jay Gould or or Andrew Carnegie, right? They were business people. Small, you know, they ran small and medium sized businesses. They wanted to protect private property. Uh, they wanted to to keep you know maintain control of their workplaces, right? It wasn't it wasn't about you know oh we, you know the the small business people and labor against the big capitalists in certain cases that was true but certainly not not in the context of the 1886 strike. So and that's a big I mean that's a big historiographical distinction. So for any students that are listening or anyone who's teaching the Gilded Age and Progressive Era, the anti-monopoly view of these groups it's it's I mean and your your evidence is basically that the numbers are there. It's not just. Jay Gould and big industrialists that are uh, promoting these law enforcement uh, or, or law and order leagues, they're widespread, right? I mean, this is they're a, widespread. Yeah, it's 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 it's, it's grassroots too, right? Right, it's it's grassroots. You know, um, I I didn't have the article at the time when I finished this book, but um, there's a guy by the name of Patrick Wyman. Maybe you've heard of him. Uh, he wrote an article um, about a little bit more than a year ago, I think, called uh, in the Atlantic Monthly, called the American Gentry. And what he looked at was the 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 most privileged residents in in you know medium sized towns and cities around the country, right? People who say who might um, run say construction companies, right? Or or uh, you know uh, small businesses, maybe they they own you know um, you know a few banks or something, right? They're not Jay Goulds. They're not at that level, but they're still powerful. They're very powerful people in their their communities. And they many of these folks might identify as small business owners, right? Even though it's not so small. Their, their, their businesses, you know, we're, we're not we're not especially small. So um, I think he does a good job in kind of showing, you know, uh, power relations. And so I would apply his analysis to contemporary America to the late 19th and early 20th century, right? 
Um, I mean, the um, the credit merchants, right? The bankers, the, the folks who were lawyers, right? These folks didn't support labor unrest, right? They weren't going out there protesting, you know, burning down, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, boxcars and that kind of thing, right? right? They didn't do that, right? I mean, it's. I think this is a very compelling just on the sheer numbers and the size of these organizations. Um, in chapter three, uh, you explore the mine operators in Idaho. And I just want you to tell us what happens here in the 1890s that's so important. Yeah, so um, there's a number, there are two major uh, labor conflicts in Northern Idaho, the Coeur d'Alene's region. Uh, one occurs in 1892 and the other in 1899. And here you have um, a, a employers active in the mine owners, mine owners association of that region, and they lock out uh, strikers who want, uh, pro excuse me, union members who demand uh, wage increases and um, uh, lock them out. There's this big protest. They bring in, the employers bring in strike breakers. In some cases, the employers themselves, like John Hammond, this very powerful guy, you know, brings in, you know, actually escort strike breakers. And um, the situation gets, uh, gets very violent uh, and uh, workers demonstrate uh, much militancy. Uh, they and and to make a long story short, eventually the employers get support from state actors. Uh, we see state and federal troops come in, and um, most um, dramatically, these forces force union members into bullpens. These were cramped, often poorly ventilated places, surrounded by stockyards, uh, or stockades, excuse me, and. Um, this uh, just widespread uh, imprisonment uh, happens in uh, 1892, and it happens again in 1899. And uh, one historian, at least one historian, has said that this was the first use of the concentration camp. Historians often look at the, the role of the Spaniards in Cuba uh, as the first case, but uh, there's there's a case to be made that uh, northern Idaho uh, introduce this method. Uh, I don't know enough. I'm, I'm merely pointing out that uh, this is what, what a historian has said. It seems to be um, a strong, you know, one could make a strong case for that. Um, and so this was, you know, uh, a shocking episode in that you have these, these mass arrests. Uh, you also have a, a Law and Order League emerge in 1892 uh, during this, this conflict, and um, it gets national attention all over. Um, Benjamin Harrison assists the uh, mine owners in 1892. William McKinley assisted them in 1899. And um, it, in the context of um, bolt strikes, it's about sheltering, or excuse me, it's about preventing strikers and union supporters from influencing the, um, the strike breakers. And so the strike breakers come in, they're shielded from the, the union men, and uh, we see a, um, a a real victory, uh, in at least in 1899. In 1893, uh, the workers win somewhat of a victory. There's a Supreme Court case that uh, that says that they were, that the state had overreached in its um, draconian policy of, of locking everybody up. But what's interesting there is that in 1892, uh, workers there use the opportunity of their incarceration to talk with one another about conditions. And the following year, we see the formation of the Western Federation of Miners. So uh, the, the incarcerated workers use their time productively to build something. Just for uh, for listeners, we're going to be talking with Simon Cordry in a couple of weeks about Mother Jones, which will kind of take us to the next stage of this uh, Western sort of miners and uh, their 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 trials and tribulations. But you brought up Harrison and McKinley there, and they come under uh, uh, fire in the book for being uh, uh, largely on the side of the operators. When your book turns to the anthracite coal strike of 1902, you naturally write about Theodore Roosevelt. And as you might know, I know this, I knew this was coming. I you knew it was coming. <laughs> I'm kind of consumed by his administration. And I've talked about, uh, um, you know, about this episode, the anthracite coal strike and other podcasts, in fact, about it being one of the most important for federal power over corporate greed. 
And it's, it's, I think for me, it's as important as trust busting. And, you know, Theodore Roosevelt gets a lot of credit for trust busting, but the coal strike, I think, is even more important. And your verdict is actually one I quite like. You write this. Roosevelt behaved far less reprehensible than his predecessors. I think that's right. His, uh, his personal diplomacy solved the crisis, even if everyone felt hard done by at the end of it. And he gave agency, if not recognition, to the union. But you still refer to Roosevelt's square deal as systematic denial of fairness for workers. And I want to understand how we get there from him not being the worst and, you know, using federal power in a way that, you know, at least the coal strike seemed fair uh, to the square deal being a, a concept that actually doesn't play out the way maybe he intended it to. Sure. Um, Theodore Roosevelt was an unapologetic supporter of the open shop principle. The open shop principle says that workers do not need to join a union to uh, work in a particular workplace. So it basically prioritized individual rights over union rights, okay? And so if you read the report from this, this, this strike, it basically says that non-union members have the same rights as union members. So how does that work in practice? It actually says that union members should not bother those who don't want to join the union and that union members should not pressure management to acknowledge the union. What was the one thing, the central goal of unions? Recognition. It has completely undermined that. And so I take on, I think, the dominant scholarly opinion about this, which is that it was a victory. No. In fact, the Citizens Industrial Association of America were so excited about this, um, the outcome, this report, that they named their newspaper, their publication, The Square Deal, their Square Deal. And so uh, Roosevelt uh, uh, legitimized enormously the open shop principle. And shortly thereafter, the National Association of Manufacturers had their, their uh, 1903 conference, and uh, the open shop issue becomes central to their, their activities. And their members credit uh, Roosevelt. And so... Did it stop strike breaking? No. Did it stop union busting? No. And it called for the establishment of a new police force, a state police force. Right. I mean, it's one of the, it's the one thing that doesn't come out of the, the, the commission is that the union is not recognized. And that that also throw, throws a lot of the uh, union forces into, uh, you know, strife with, with within the union. So, you yep. know, Mitchell and Mother Jones don't get on, um, sure. you know, there and there's disagreements about this within the labor movement itself. Right. So it's not right. It, it's not just a um, the, the federal power that is has uh, is, is got disagreements about this within the labor movement. There's disagreements, too. Right. Sure. I think there's there were always divisions or, or you know, always there's always been tension between union leaders and the rank and file, right? Mitchell, in many ways, Gompers, uh, these people often want to kind of, you know, schmooze with powerful people, uh, sometimes more than than actual actually fight. That's not always the case, but uh, certainly uh, we can identify differences between the leadership and the rank and file. Uh, I provide evidence that shows that many rank and file members were dissatisfied with the outcome of this, with the award, right? The number one goal of, of unions is recognition, right? And that's not recognition. And in fact, Roosevelt would go, uh, would do other things. Uh, there's the Miller decision, the printing case. Um, I don't talk about it in this book, but I do in my first book, uh, where unions sought to uh, establish um, a closed shop and, and uh, Roosevelt wanted to have nothing to do with it. He sends in troops uh, into Nevada against the IWW. And not in my book or either book, um, uh, C.W. Post, who's a leader of the um, Citizens Industrial Association of America, uh, in 1910 wanted to start another, a new anti-union group, and he asked. He wrote to Theodore Roosevelt asking if he would uh, head it, and uh, Theodore Roosevelt, you know, s said no. But really, good luck. I think it's great what you're doing. So, um, can we can we agree though that the the, the commission for the anthracite coal strike, which goes on for years and sets the tone for negotiations, is a much different thing than what the unions want or what the operators want. I mean, it's it's almost a third way. And, you know, dare I say, it looks like Italian corporations of the 1930s. It's a it's it's a model that is a third way rather than what the union wants, which is recognition or what yeah. the operators want, which is a free hand. 
Yeah, I, you know, I, I suppose, I suppose, but um, I think, you know, it's, it, I mean, you look at the, the makeup of the commissioners, right? There's no labor people there. There are no labor people there, right? And so how, how is this, you know, it seems like the bar is so low, Right. You know, I mean, the, uh, what, what he didn't he didn't send in troops to, and throw them into bullpens. Right. <laughs> that's you know, that's progress. Right. I guess that's progress. But I, I think uh, uh, I think what what workers wanted, um, if you read uh, certainly the left, they're very critical of, of Roosevelt. Uh, and so, you know, I don't uh, I'm hard on him um, because because uh, so many folks in the union busting community love him so much. Right. They loved him so much. Yeah, I, I think it's interesting. I think actually this is a, a very much about the enigma of Roosevelt for me is that on both sides, you know, whether you're left or right, uh, but especially if you're centrist, um, Roosevelt can be a figure of uh, admiration or disdain. Um, so anyway, that's a very interesting side note, but it's um, the, I, I do think the anthracite coal strike is one of the most remarkable incidents in, in labor history, if, if not for being, you know, on anyone's uh, uh, radar. Um, right. So what's the legacy of the, the coal strike and that presidential commission? How do we view federal intervention in labor disputes after 1902? Uh, you know, I still I think the evidence shows that the um, the, the federal government, state governments, no, none of these uh, forces wanted to see outbreaks of, of labor militancy. And so um, you don't. Uh, you know, you, you you have you have politicians who support the open shop movement, including Woodrow Wilson, talks openly about it later on. Um, again, this isn't in this book, but it's in my, my first book. Um, it's not really until the 1930s where you, you really see some uh, recognition of unions. And then, too, I think it's about uh, controlling uh, uh, labor more so than emancipating it. Uh, you know, we can we can debate uh, the Wagner Act. But um, but yeah, no, I, I think um, uh, I, I think historians have not not enough historians, in my opinion, have appreciated how the square deal inspired the open shop movement as opposed to um, stand, you know, as opposed to, uh, you know, they, they weren't criticizing it. Um, and the, the folks I studied did not criticize it. Yeah, I think it's so interesting because I think, again, it's almost. Um it's almost a, a matter of perception and a matter of use. Um, and I, I mean, I think generally Theodore Roosevelt's ideas, words, et cetera, have been used and abused, you know, endlessly over the sure. last uh, 100 odd years. Um, your last chapter looks at one of uh, Theodore Roosevelt's great friends, actually, Owen Wister. Yes. And uh, it's a great addition to the book because it is, it, it, this is really an interdisciplinary study. I've said, uh, I said uh, intersectional as well, but Tell us what Wister brings to the story and how the literature and the myth making of, of Wister creates uh, uh, problems for labor movements. Sure. So um, Owen Wister, again, was such an enormously important uh, novelist. He really developed the Western uh, tradition of of, um, of 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 literature, uh, particularly with his The Virginian. 1902. It was a bestseller, and it was loosely based on the um, Johnson County War. The Johnson County War from 1892 pitted the uh, the um, Wyoming Stock Growers Association against these these rustlers or alleged rustlers. Uh, the uh, Wyoming Stock Growers Association go into Johnson County, Wyoming, in 1892 with a big posse. They kill a couple of folks before the uh, before the the community rises up against them. Benjamin Harrison, again, uh, sends in troops to protect uh, the Wyoming Stock Growers Association, these vigilantes. They also receive protection from the governor, who's also a member of the Wyoming Stock Growers Association. In any event, it was a public relations disaster for these cattlemen, right? They went in, they killed folks, they had a 70-person kill list. And so there were some folks who, uh, who wrote very critically about them. And, uh, and so they needed some good PR. And Owen Wister was friends with, uh, with, with some of these, these members. And, and he had uh, gone to uh, the Cheyenne Club and hung out with a bunch of them on, on numerous occasions and got this inspiration to, to write a book uh, that, would, um, that would sort of capture what happened from their perspective. And so the Virginian looks at 
the uh, the role of uh, portrays uh, stock growers, portrays big landowners in the West in a very positive light, but it mostly focuses on uh, the main character that is the Virginian, uh, this sort of um, uh, individualistic, tough-minded uh, cowboy, and um, he he. He's very deferential to the uh, uh, his boss, uh, very deferential to the landowning class, uh, denounces uh, rustling throughout the book. And uh, at the end of the day, he kills the um, uh, the villain. And uh, this is, um, you know, a great, um, a great outcome. And so um, w one of the statements in that book is um, that uh, uh that, that those in favor of, of, of law and order can um, choose the law or popular justice, the law or popular justice, meaning that if the courts, you know, the legal system worked in, you know, in, in their interest, fine. If not, you know, you can shoot somebody basically. Right. And so um, an enormously important author who had a lot of, uh, you know, his book was, was best selling. So, um, he uh, uh, he was a wealthy Philadelphian himself. Owen Worcester went to Harvard. Was friendly with Theodore Roosevelt. I think he devoted the, the Virginian to Theodore Roosevelt. And um, fast forward to 1907, and C.W. Post, the leader of the Citizens Industrial Association of America at that time, appointed Post to its propaganda committee. This is a half dozen folks who would do. Uh, propaganda for the employers. And so who better than C.W. Post, right, who would write articles about how bad unions were, who would call strike breakers um, heroes. And so this was a huge accomplishment for, for, the, uh, for the organized employers to have somebody uh, who was that um, significant on their payroll was really, was really something. It's it's remarkable, too. I mean, again, this goes back to the point about how you can use and abuse people. But Wister was allowing himself to be used and depicted in this way as being a part of these Citizens Alliance groups. Right. 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 I think he was very much in favor of what they did. I mean, he he supported what the Wyoming Stock Growers Association did in Johnson County. Um, he called scabs heroes. He um you know, he held membership in the Citizens Industrial Association of America. So that was the one of the leading anti-union groups of that of that time. Chad, this book is fantastic. Um, I'll, I'll be straight with you. I don't agree with everything in it. Right. In terms of there's some real big historiographical debates here. But this is exactly the kind of book we tell our students to read or or the, the essays that they need to write. You know, there's an argument here. There's tons of evidence. You've done a huge amount of research. I guarantee you it's provocative too, right? I mean, we've, we've said that word a couple of times. Right, right, right. It's provocative. We will be debating the contents of your book for a long time to come. And that that makes it a really special read. And I can't, I can't thank you enough for joining us on the show. And I can't wait to hear people's reactions to what you've written because it's really, it's something else. Well, thank you so much. I'm, I'm really flattered by that, uh, that compliment. It's great to have you on the show. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks so much. Well, that's all we have time for. Thanks for listening. You can follow the Gilded Age and Progressive Era on Twitter or on my website, michaelpatrickcullinane.com. Please consider subscribing or reviewing the podcast wherever you listen because it really makes a big difference and helps direct others to the show. I hope you'll join me again for the next episode.